Welcome back everybody to our final session of the day, which is rethinking how to manage and mitigate risks. Michelle Green from Jacobs is gonna walk us through this. Michelle, take it away. Great, thanks Jeff. Hey, um, good morning, good afternoon, I guess almost afternoon everybody. Um, this has been a really um, great uh, summit and session. I'm super excited to be part of it. So um, we can go ahead and move to the next slide, if you would, please. So agenda, um, I want to kind of just talk a little bit about evolution of this presentation, <laughs> um, what um, kind of frame up what, what I'm talking about, um, and then just do some basic uh, discussion um, about definition of terminology, what is risk management, what does it mean, and then um, just really provide some specific examples of how we can think differently in the context of design, bid, build, um, implementing best um, risk management practices, and then some you know, challenges and ideas about how you might change the paradigm. Next slide, please. So characteristics of design build. Um, you know, um, the, uh, the characteristics of the model, right, is that the designer is working towards a standard of care. Um, and then you're paying a contractor um, to build um, to build what, what has been designed, what's on the plans and specs. And so they're responsible for conformance with the ASBID documents, right? And what that leaves is the owner really in the middle um, with a continued responsibility to hold all risks for performance and budget. And they are in the middle of those disputes. Um, so um, what's, what, what, what has, uh, has kind of evolved to and left us with, um, next slide please, um, is, is a culture um, that maybe isn't always um, focused on kind of best project outcomes, right? So, you know, the picture on the left, right, is a sketch of the uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, you know, Michelangelo, grand architect, um, you know, and where we've, where we've moved to really, um, especially pretty quickly over the last several decades is towards, you know, developing these kind of bulletproof documents and contracts that make the res contractor responsible for everything. Really, um, you know, starting with, right, the, um, that traditional design bid build model, which um, leaves, the, leaves the owner open to, um, to claims, to change orders, um, because, you know, everything's in kind of a low bid environment. Um, and so then the next, that just kind of builds on itself, right? The next time around, um, owners of engineers make the documents even more bulletproof. So, um, so that, you know, maybe isn't really kind of the best, uh, doesn't result in the best project outcomes. Um, next slide, please. So that kind of um, shift towards, um, you know, trying to push all that risk onto the contractor, right, really creates some problems. Um, as, as, um, as that happens, right, there's what, what effectively occurs is that, um, owners and engineers are um, increasing the cost of the project by some unknown factor, right? You don't really know um, what the cost is for that additional contract term or for that requirement and the documents or the drawings. Um, and so you really, so those two things are really disconnected. Um, the second thing that happens is that, or that's often happens, right? Is the contractor that takes the riskiest approach is very likely to be the low bidder. Right, and so that um, that means that that increases the potential for for um, change orders, change orders and claims as they look for opportunities to kind of make up ground or make up you know the money that they left on the table as compared to the second bidder, um, and this kind of builds on itself and it really creates this culture of risk transfer no matter what. Right, so because I had this claim on the last job, I'm gonna to try to be even more bulletproof in my documents the next time around. I'm gonna shift all the risk. I don't wanna be back in front of my management or my, my electeds talking about why we had these significant change orders and certainly claims are painful um, to deal with. And so kind of what happens is we, we continue to try to push this risk off on the contractor in traditional delivery is we as owners and engineers become kind of blind to the implication of the decisions that we make that have a direct impact on the success of our project. So next slide, please. So, you know, there's been a lot of movement in the industry towards um, 
implementation of collaborative delivery models. Um, and the, uh, those models, one of the benefits of those models is they manage risk really differently than traditional delivery. So kind of at the far end, the far right side of the spectrum, all the risk is transferred. You know, owners have to really clearly define existing conditions, risk allocation. Um, in the middle, the risk allocation is negotiated. It's a huge part of the, the conversation, negotiation, discussion, and development of kind of the second phase of those contracts. Um, but really, in all instances, risks are actively managed to drive to lower cost and better project outcomes. So that really gets me to the evolution of this presentation. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of education and training about collaborative delivery models. And some of the feedback I get is, wow, that sounds really great. I would love to be able to try some of these, but um, the procurement will never have it. You know, my projects aren't complex enough. My projects are too small. Um, so, you know, it just doesn't really make sense for me. So it sounds really cool, but I can't. I can't implement any of these things. Um, and so what I wanted to try to do today is talk about how, you know, some of these really pretty, pretty simplistic, can be simplistic, um, simple approaches to think a little bit differently about how you manage risk, how you can incorporate some of these tools and concepts and thinking into traditional delivery. So next slide, please. So how did we get here? Um, I think, uh, Hopefully that, that kind of covers what I'm trying to cover today. Um, but let's move into just um, what is risk management? Talk a little bit about um, kind of establishing some common terminology. So next slide, please. So risk management, it is a structured approach to identify, quantify, mitigate, and assign real and potential project risks that consider both probability and impact. So it's a process, it's an approach, right? So just to kind of walk through this little graphic here, you start off just by identi identifying risks. It can help to think about the different categories of risk to kind of focus on what am I really concerned about? Um, you define a consequence associated with every one of those risks, just define the likelihood, how, how likely is it that it will happen or not, develop some mitigation approach to, um, to address both the likelihood and the consequence, Confirm the benefit, does it make sense? Um, and then just kind of continue with that process um, periodically, regularly throughout the process, throughout your project, and then implement, implement the approach. Next slide. So um, the best way, or a very common way, simple way to do this is utilize a risk register that is simply a document, documentation tool. There are fancier versions out there, but at its most basic, it can be, simply be a spreadsheet. And I like, to I like to describe this tool as like a name your fear tool. Like, what are you worried about? What, is, what are you concerned about? What do you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about? Um, and when you write it down, I, I always feel personally like you have a little more power over um, management of that fear instead of just this nagging worry. It, um, it draws focus of the team um, and then you can do something with that with, with those risks. So again, there's you can um, you can um, categorize those risks. Um, what I like to do is get the team kind of together, um, take uh, send out the risk register ahead of time, schedule a meeting, tell everybody to write down all the stuff they're worried about. And, um, and then get together as a group um, and review those. And then there's always some, um, some benefit to think about, um, I guess, to expand the thinking, right? Everybody has about, you know, what did we miss? Or, oh, you have a similar uh, thinking there on the risks as, as I do. You know, it might prompt new ideas. And then also encourage people to not forget about opportunities, right? There's not only potential downsides to the projects, but there's potential upsides. So write everything down. Um, and next slide, please. And then um, really start, go through each one. And this is a bit of a grind initially, um, but I, I promise it provides value. So for each risk, identify the probability of each risk and the impact of each risk. Um, and then start by highest risk. Um, this is just an output of a uh, a risk register spreadsheet, again, spreadsheet tool that, that we utilize that has some nice formatting to it so that when you, it, it really quickly and visually flags what are um, risks that have high impact and or probability of consequence versus those that don't. Um, I wonder that one of the easy things that I find that comes out of this is there might be something that you're really worried about or you just, you think, God, that's, 
you know, I've got a high likelihood that that could happen and what are we going to do? But when you analyze it and you find that, you know, yeah, this, this is a risk and, you know, maybe it has $5,000 worth of impact or, you know, boy, the, the likelihood of that occurring is really low. Um, you should keep those on your risk register. You should revisit them periodically, but it gives you the opportunity to kind of quit losing sleep <laughs> over those items. So next slide. Um, for those items that are red and yellow, right, that have a higher um, either probability or impact to your project if they occur, make a plan. Figure out how can I reduce this risk? What am I going to do if it happens? Um, how, do, how do I manage that? And you have the options, right? You have, you have several options what to do with each of those risks. You can avoid it. You know, if I'm going to, you know, if I, if I go this way with a pipeline project and I, you know, trigger something, but if I go that way, um, then, you know, that risk goes away. Avoid is a great mitigation tool. Um, mitigate, you know, figure out ways to reduce the potential impact or the, or the likelihood that it will happen. Um, you can accept the risk. Um, this is something that owners do inherently on, um, on many, um, many risks um, that occur. Um, a good example of that is force majeure, right? You're never going to be able to to afford to pay somebody to take on that risk. So you accept that risk, it has a low probability. Um, you know, you deal with it if it happens or transfer risk. And sometimes that's appropriate when you transfer the risk to the contractor or an equipment supplier and say, you're gonna be responsible for this and I'm willing to pay it. So you go through that, um, that risk register, you prioritize everything, you start to make plans. Um, and then once you've kind of got things set up initially, um, you're revisiting regularly, um, you know, kind of depending on the scale of the project, um, complexity of the project, the schedule of the project um, could be as much as monthly, I would say at least quarterly, um, but you're kind of regularly updating, you know, we did these mitigations and now, you know, here's where we're at. And so we need to tweak our mitigation or we were able to downgrade the likelihood of that risk or, or the consequence of that risk. Next slide, please. So I want to, I have been to so many presentations where they talk about this process and it's like, yeah, that kind of makes sense, but what are they really talking about? So I'd like to provide, what I've got here is a number of examples um, to try to um, really um, more clearly illustrate how to implement some of these tools, because I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, it's not so esoteric when you, when you talk about specific concrete examples. So this is a project, um, this is one of my projects. It happens to be progressive design build, but again, this, this is, these are tools that you can implement in traditional delivery as well. Um, and, and my point here is how, really looking at how active risk management during design can refine the construction cost, approach and the cost. So in this project, you can see um, on the photo there, um, we're, we're building a new primary clarifier and a new aeration base in existing wastewater treatment plant. And we had heard um, kind of anecdotally from plant staff and from city staff that the plant, a portion of the pl plant site, like back in the 30s used to be used as like this active dump site. It wasn't like a formal municipal solids waste site, but people used to throw, there was a hole and people used to throw stuff in it, right? So we had some really really big concerns about how we're going to deal with that from a construction perspective. So we got some aerial photos, um, historical aer aerial photos that showed that, yeah, there was indeed, you know, a big hole on the site. Um, and it seemed to be limited to the primary clarifier that we were building and not the aeration basin, which is off to the, to the right side of that photo. Could you click to the next slide, please? All right, yeah, thank you. So what we did, oh, no, no. Go back one, I just wanted to see the photos, thank you. So what we did um, was we spent $25,000, $25,000 and did some, you know, potholing and selective pre-excavation to kind of see what was there. Um, and you can see from those photos, um, the area by the primary clarifier did indeed have some stuff in it, right? Some stuff that we didn't really want to deal with, certainly not during construction. Um, and that fill was not um, suitable. Um, for for any kind of you know foundational support, um, but the aeration basin was actually just native material, um, and so it was going to be fine for for um, support of that new structure. Next slide. So um, so what we did then is 
because we had that information, we're able to design the primary clarifier foundation stable approach, stabilization approach in a way that minimized risks related to those unknowns and poor quality materials. So we designed it based on peers. Um, we did some pre-excavation in the construction contracts, specifically in the areas that the peers would go. Um, and what we did then is avoided extensive excavation and disposal costs. We didn't want to dig any more material up in that location than we had to. We reduced dewatering costs because we were, our excavation wasn't so deep. Minimized shoring costs. We were building next to an existing primary clarifier. And the conditions were as we expected because we had done a little bit of that work initially. Over in the aeration basin, we designed that, um, that structure with just a standard slab on grade. And so we spent $25,000 and we reduced the project cost before we even got the design, really the design of the project. Now, through the design of the project, we reduced the cost by $1.2 million. And this was all before we got into construction, right? So, so this is a strategy that can be utilized on any traditional project if you allow yourself the flexibility um, to, to spend a little bit of money, right? To get, you, you know, to, to hire a contract or whatever, you know, do some potholing, whatever you need to do um, to, uh, to, to do that work during design. Um, let's go into the next slide. So um, the other thing that you can do really specific to construction is structure your bid documents to accept some risk and that can reduce overall cost. And so this is something that I think is a is maybe a bigger ask is a fundamental shift away from kind of you know, our evolution towards just shifting all the risk on the contractor. Um, but let me talk you through some examples. Um, so I have um, two separate projects where we've taken this, this approach. One was a traditional design to build, and one was a CMGC, pro C CMGC project, both pipeline construction projects. So in both instances, there was some potential for some significant dewatering, but it's going to be based on the schedule, right? It was a long enough project, right, where there was dry season and wet season components. And so, um, you know, trying to think about how do we manage that risk? And um, there's also some potential for unsuitable soils and that varied a little bit based on the weather, but also just kind of, you know, in some instances it'll be usable in some instances it won't. So what we did in both instances where we knew that the dewatering was gonna be significant if the, you know, if the pipeline trench was really, really deep and we knew it was going to be, uh, you know, an issue, you know, we dictated the approach. We said, this is, we're just going to assume or require that dewatering pr be provided in these areas. And then for the other areas, rather than making it incidental, rather than saying, contractor, you just figure it out, right? And I'm going to, you know, pay you. I don't know what I'm going to pay you, but, you know, you're going to have to incorporate that into your bid. Um, we basically made that an allowance um, in, in the context of the CMGC and in the context of traditional delivery design bid build, we made it a specific pay item. And so what that does then, instead of, um, allow, or instead of allowing bidders to decide how much, how risk, how risk, how, what risk they wanted to take in their bid, um, we as let, the, let that responsibility with the owner. And so at the end of the day, then the owner paid for only what was actually required and they eliminated the variability there in, in the bid documents, um, which could have led towards, um, led to a, um, you know, a, a, a more um, contentious relationship with a bidder if they got into, into problems. And if they didn't get into problems, then they would pocket the money. So in this instance, the owner got to keep that, keep that money. In both of these projects, the dewatering didn't end up impacting the contractor for those areas where we had said, you know, we're going to own that responsibility as the owner. Um, the soils tended to be better than expected. And so again, the owner pocketed the differential there instead of the contractor. Next slide, please. So um, another example. Um, so in this instance, um, another pipeline job, um, there was a portion of the work that was um, within a major arterial, ar arterial. And the closing down of that roadway was not an option. Um, during the summer, it was, it was just really impactful to close down the road. So rather than telling the contractor, you know, you figure it out, 
um, the owner decided to specify a particular type of shoring that provided, it was more expensive, but provided better certainty that it was um, going to provide the support that didn't have, um, you know, the potential for, um, you know, um, the, the road degrading, you know, um, so, so that was important to the length of time that road was closed was important to the owner and they said we're going to, um, we're going to own that risk. Um, you know, other examples is, you know, allowing, not allowing winter construction in an area um, that was really critical um, during, I, in, in the middle of the I-5 median. Um, and so, so the, the key piece to this is that the owner was willing to either, you know, dictate um, the particular approach because they knew it was important to them or the, and, or the owner was willing to, um, to, to hold that risk. And what that translates to is they were willing to pay a change order um, and held some contingency on their side to pay for what was actually required rather than letting the contractor take that risk. And what that does then is it really levels the field on playing day, which sets you up for, um, you know, really potential for better outcomes. Next slide, please. Okay, so a couple of very quick examples there, but I want to, um, you know, kind of bring this home in terms of how do we, um, and challenging, right, right, you're thinking about how to change the paradigm. Next slide. So I want to just be really, really clear um, that complete risk transfer, transfer, especially, well, really in any contracting mechanism is a, is a misnomer. Um, you just, if you think that I'm just transferring all this risk to the contractor, um, you're increase, you have the potential to increase your project costs and, um, and really increase the potential for change orders and claims. And that mentality, this no change order, we're not having any change orders, that mentality is going to drive up project costs and again, increase the potential for claims. Next slide. So the shift in philosophy, right? Uh, what I encourage folks to do during design, and this is easy to do in traditional design bid build. So mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Really think, um, <laughs> write down your fears, analyze them, and identify plans to help mitigate them. Name the collective fear. I would say putting the designer's worries in the hands of the owners. That's one um, big, big piece that I've learned um, working you know, in different delivery models over the years is when designers are concerned, they incorporate conservatism and that drives up project costs. If you give them the opportunity to um, tell you what they're worried about, right? And then you put that information in the hands of the owners, then the owner who's responsible for paying <laughs> for paying for the project, for responding um, to their rate payers, for making the decisions about what's the best value for the rate payers. Those decisions should be the owner's decision and not the designer's decision. And unless you ask the designers to, to really tell you what their concerns are, you know, the owner will never see that and never have the opportunity to kind of provide their own, their own take on it and mitigate those, those concerns. And then this is a huge one, provide flexibility in contracts to pursue mitigation. Right, so provide yourself, um, I know this is a big ask um, in, in some organizations, but to the extent that you can provide opportunities to um, within engineering contracts um, during early on in design, <clears throat> excuse me, to pursue ideas to drive down project costs. If we do a little bit more field investigation, if we do a little bit more analysis, we can save project costs give yourself the ability to consider that. There should absolutely be a return on investment for those efforts, but if you spent $20,000 in additional you know, structural analysis about a seismic condition and could save $1.2 million, you should be able to pursue that, right? Don't sell yourself, but if you don't have a mechanism to tap an allowance or a contingency or a change order within, you know, within your contract structure, you're not going to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. Next slide. So then the big shift in philosophy specific to bid documents. So really, again, you've identified all your fears and you've 
mitigate them to the extent that you have that you can. And at the end of the day, you got to decide what do you want to own and what do you want to control, and then limit the contractor's risk by providing a clear basis of bid. So even when you want to transfer the risk, tell them what to assume. I know that sounds heretical <laughs> in some instances, and again, this is not you know every single every single um, example, but where it's risky, I would argue for you for your consideration that the owner, the contractor, um, and the project is better served by everybody understanding what the bid is and then having a basis to negotiate from that plus or minus, as opposed to, I haven't really defined anything besides the problem. And now um, we're arguing with no, you know, consistent basis, um, no consistent basis and not to, uh, that provides even more opportunity for, for claims. So understand where you're okay with the contractor taking risks, right? Understand where you're like, you know, we need to dewater this hole. It's a really clear, it's really clear that dewatering is required. You guys got to figure it out. Absolutely reasonable and appropriate. So long as they, the contractor has the basis to kind of understand the problem. Um, incorporate allowances and or owner contingency to manage costs, right? And so these are things like some of the examples I provided about, um, you know, dealing with unsuitable soils, dealing with uh, dewatering, um, dealing with things that you can expect to occur, but you don't know the magnitude, right? So you know in two miles of pipeline, there will be unsuitable soils, and you know that during those, in those two miles, there will be soils that are fine, right? But you, you know, defining say, you know what, I want everybody to assume 25% of the length is unsuitable. What it pick, pick a number, right? And then if it's more than that, um, you know, pick pick on the low side, right? But if it's more than that, then you pay for it, right? As opposed to just like you figure it out and whoever assumes zero, you know, zero percentage of the lineal footage. Um, is going to be your bidder, and that's going to be who you're working with. Um, that doesn't really set you up for success. So that requires you to, you know, put, incorporate some flexibility into your contracts in ways that um, you maybe haven't before. So think about it. Find ways to 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 be uh, to be strategic and clever about how to do that. And then, you know, the really big ask, right, is really changing our way of thinking. So work with your clients, right? Your managers, your procurement departments, and you know, see what you can do to move away from this no change order goal towards a managed owner contingency. And so I, I recognize that that's a big ask. Um, and <laughs> I think that it um, is absolutely the key towards um, promoting better project outcomes. So I am going to uh, leave it with that. I think that next slide is my last last one and open to questions. We've got a couple questions or a couple minutes for questions. If folks have them, please shoot them in the chat. Uh, Michelle, that was really riveting. That was uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so do you think if if folks made an allowance for some of the risky components, do you think if they brought a contractor on board, they could help brainstorm ways to resolve that risk and, and save the project some money during, during in essence, a pre-construction phase of a design bid build? Right, right. Um, so, you know, that's a good question. I think that, you know, to the extent that you can do constructability reviews um, during the design phase of a design build, bid, bid build project, that that can provide some value. I think, you know, Jeff, you and I have talked about this before, I believe, right? I mean, there's challenges associated with doing that. Um, you know, how do you how do you keep somebody from, um, you know, conflicting themselves out, out from bidding? How are you fair to all contractors, right? Um, but, you know, there's a lot of resources that aren't actively bidding jobs. Um, you know, a lot of retired folks that have been contractors that kind of put out a shingle that, you know, you can incorporate. And a lot of, you know, knowledge based on the side of owners and engineers who have managed construction projects and been out in the field. So, absolutely agree that, you know, trying to find ways to incorporate uh, constructability review is good. Um, you know, there's challenges in how you do it, but, you know, 
Come on. I, I don't think I communicated it clearly. What I what I was thinking was that the the awarded contractor would be able to. Ah. It. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, it, you know, it does kind of open Pandora's box a little bit. So I think you know, bounding the ideas um, or the areas that you want to focus upon um, would probably be 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 good. Um, and, you know, certainly within the structure of design build, build contracts, right, there's an opportunity for them to provide substitution. So, you know, there's a session earlier on partnering, right? And I think really um, coming at it, all parties coming at even the traditional delivery approach with, um, you know, that, that, culture, right, um, of, of partnering together to identify and consider opportunities is, is, a, is a really good one. All right. Well, thank you, Michelle, for your time. That was fantastic and really appreciate it. Well, that, Thanks, concludes, oh, that concludes our, our sessions for the day. I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, presenting, taking the time to do it. I want to thank all of you for joining today. I really hope you walk away with some valuable information uh, gain some information from lessons learned. I also want to thank our sponsors who really help keep PNCWA moving forward, uh, especially in these trying times. So our gold sponsors for this event were Brown and Caldwell, Carollo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering, Sladen, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy Jinx. And our silver sponsors were Stantec, Tanemic, Honeycuts, James W. Fowler, and ESI Construction. Uh, your sponsorship really means a lot for us. Thank you. Uh, but we're not done yet. Please join us in the Zoom room uh, starting at 1225. You'll log out of this session and into a new session. And uh, we're just going to network. We'll have an opportunity to ask questions and just get to know each other further. So please join us. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>